Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? You guys are enjoying each other's company? Let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll, we're going to finish First John tonight, um, 13 through 21. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we could spend together. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We ask your continued protection upon us, Lord. We trust in you with, um, with every breath that we have, Lord. We understand, Lord, that, um, Lord, our whole uh, existence, Lord, hangs on, on you. Lord, you're the author and, and creator and the finisher of our faith, Lord Jesus. Everything we have comes from you. Um, you're, you're our life, Lord. So we pray, Lord, tonight that you would speak to us. Um, from heaven, Lord, from the borders of another world. Bring the atmosphere of heaven to this room, Lord, I pray. And by the power of your spirit, take the things that belong to you, Jesus, and reveal them to each one of our hearts. We want to leave here loving you more, filled with your spirit, Lord, trusting in those things that you've promised, Lord. Um, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We pray, Lord, that we might see that tonight. We might leave this place, Lord, with a sense of assurance of your grace and love in our lives, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's read verse 13. Just jump right in. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So eternal life and believing on the name of the Son of God are attached. And John says, I wrote this whole epistle, these five chapters, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Um, uh, assurance. So this, this verse is, is a key verse for Christians. And he's saying he's right. He wrote this whole thing. So to say that Christians shouldn't struggle with assurance would be, there would be no reason for First John would be written. He's expecting that some of us might struggle from time to time. Am I saved or not? Does everybody here believe that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? You know, we, we, we say that. 90% of people in America believe that. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. Why are we getting to heaven? Why are we the ones that are going to get there? And he's told us the marks of somebody who, how they can know they are saved, the things that he, and I'll go through them in a minute. But I also want to let you realize too that there's a lot of people that think they're saved that they're not saved. So assurance is, 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 is a funny thing. I think the enemy, those of us who believe and are going to heaven, he wants us to doubt our assurance in Jesus Christ. Other people that think they're going to heaven and they're not, he wants them to believe they are going to heaven. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, 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 uh, the, you have to take a good look at your life and make your calling and election short and make sure that you are in the faith to see if these things are in you. One of the reasons why we doubt our, our salvation could be, number one, we grew up in a church where they put this high standard up of holy living and we can never attain to it, but they didn't give you the gospel too. Many people think the gospel's just for people that are saved. Let me tell you something, the gospel is an everyday thing. Because if you're anything like me or anything like most of the world, we believe there is something in each one of us that feels like we have to earn it. Now, when I sit down to pray or I get up to do devotions, I want fellowship with the Lord, there's a little thing in my head that sometimes tells me, okay, how good have you been living? How much have you loved God? Well, I haven't loved God perfectly. I haven't loved him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. What makes you think God wants to fellowship with you? What makes you think God is going to receive you into heaven? Then I have to go back on what I know. You must know your word. The fact is, none of us deserve salvation. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace through faith in him. See, the only one that lived this life perfectly and had perfect fellowship with the Father was Jesus when he lived here. He never did, said, or went anywhere unless God told him to go do or say it. So we go to God not based on our own effort or our own work or how we're doing this week or that week. I feel more saved when I'm more obedient and less saved when, I, when I'm not obedient. Um, but, but he's saying we got we to understand salvation. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This first thing he said, we're all sinners. If you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. And we all need Jesus. See, Jesus lived this life perfectly, took that perfect life, and died on the cross to pay for all of our sins. So when we go to God, we go to God through Jesus, and he receives us and sees Christ in us, not our failure. Jesus took all our failure on the cross, and now we live through him. And if we love him and understand what he's done for us, that will change our life. The, 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 the outpouring of that will be the one thing that I could say, how can you tell if you're, if you're a Christian or you're going to heaven, you know you're going to heaven. The one thing I can say for sure is that God has done a deep work in your life and it's continued. It has never stopped. 
Now we fail, we backslide, but the one thing that we can look and back and rest on is we're still moving forward with the Lord. He's, we've never left off his work in our lives. That's never stopped. If that's never stopped and God's continuing to do that work, then you can have confidence. Now, confidence or assurance is not necessary to be saved. There's a lot of Christians who struggle with assurance, like I said, and they, they go not, many people don't know where they're, you know, uh, you can't be sure until you die. John says, I wrote this so that you would know. Well, what does he wrote? He's wrote that we may know that we have eternal life, that those of us who believe in Jesus can have assurance. Spurgeon said this, assurance is not necessary for salvation. It's necessary for service. It's necessary for me. You know, when, when I get up and I want to teach, I, I, need, I need assurance. And for that, I, it's a week-to-week, day-to-day thing for me. What are the birthmarks? What are concrete examples, birthmarks of a born-again person? Well, first thing, we've been set free from satanic domination. Let's put it this way. You've seen the love of God in Jesus, and you've seen that deliver you from the bondage that you were in. If you haven't been broken any bondage, and there's new bondages that you discover all the time. That's why we feel so unworthy. We think, hey, if we get rid of these three top sins, we're, we're on our way to heaven. No, it's a continued work in our lives where we're learning to love people that don't like us. Where we're learning to give away instead of try to win. We're learning to be less selfish every day. So when we've come to realize that we are in fact sinners saved by grace, we have this inward testimony now that we, were deli- we, we know that we've been delivered from bondage because our lifestyle has changed. Now we have a desire and when hunger and thirst for righteousness. We want to be righteous. Anybody here feel bad when they're living wrong? Good, you should. If you've been born again. If Peter says you've partaken of the what? divine nature. You have the divine nature of Jesus inside of you. So if you have the divine nature of Jesus inside you, you should want what he wants. If you could care less about righteousness and you can continue to live in a lifestyle of sin and you don't really care one whit about it, it doesn't bother you at all, then maybe you haven't partaken of the divine nature. You need to check yourself. See, that's why we agree with the word of God. When people, see, many people just put up to a morality test. That's there too. But when you disagree with the word of God, if the word of Jesus is not abiding in you, then he's not in you either. So we have a whole bunch of Christians that think they have this relationship with Jesus. They may have raised their hand. They may have walked forward in in, 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 in an altar call, but then it did nothing for them experientially in their life hasn't changed them one bit. They don't hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're right there protesting for all the gay marches. They're they're all for that. That's okay. So marriage isn't what God says it is and all these other things. And you can see those earmarks. And those are the people that kind of scare me because they have a form of religion. And it says they're going to come to Jesus in that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, we built churches. We did this. We did that. And he's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. So their lifestyle was bent on iniquity. He's saying a good test to see is how much you tolerate of iniquity in your life. So this inward testimony that you want something more, you're not satisfied with with the righteousness of this world. You need something more. That's an inward change. You can't continue in a lifestyle of sin. We were once selfish and guarded. We loved getting our own way, hateful and despising of anybody who abused us or hurt us, of anyone who challenged us even. When you see it in churches and people get challenged and they get upset, that's not pride. That's not of God. So we had no time for the word of God, but now we actually love other people. We come to Wednesday night. We want to hear the word of God. We want to, we desire the Lord's statutes and commandments. They're not grievous to us. They're life to us. We understand they're good things and they're rather simple. He said it revolves around selfless love towards others, especially the brethren. We love him because he first loved us and he gives us the ability to love like he does. Unconditionally means forgiving, means forgiving the way he's forgiven us. So all we have to do is yield to and obey the spirit that he's already placed inside of us. We, it's kind of like a kid going to college. You pay for their college, you pay for their books, you pay for everything. Now you expect them to go and do what they got to do. God's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He wants us to pick them up and use them so we can grow in the faith. If you want assurance, you got to grow. The Corinthian church never grew in the Lord. Five years later, Paul says, I still can't feed you with meat because you're still on milk. You're prideful. You're going to the communion table drunk. You're doing all these things. No wonder you don't have any assurance. God has taken people early. So we have to yield to the spirit that is placed inside of us that has been given to us. 
And what I find amazing about my relationship with Jesus is that he actually talks to me. He actually talks to me through his word, talks to me through experiences that I go through. If I'm drifting, he'll do whatever it takes to bring me closer. He wants a more holy life, and I'm trying to drift and, you know, do my thing and, and, and not, not concentrate. He'll bring me back, whatever it takes. So my greatest assurance that I'm saved is seeing him work in my life even through the difficulties, and lead me. John is going to tell us now that prayer brings a confidence and a contentment when you've been praying and listening to the Lord. When that's happening, when that communication is open, that brings assurance as well. Isaiah says this, 26, verses 3 and 4 says this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah, Yahweh, is everlasting strength. In the best times of my life, I can remember prayer was being the main ingredient, spending 45 minutes to an hour walking in the park and praying. Those things, you, you know, those things were, were worth more to me than anything as I look back on them now and I desire to cultivate that prayer life once again. It's a continual thing. The Bible says to pray without what? ceasing. We're always supposed to be communicating with our Lord. That is also says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. James, the brother of Jesus, who knew Jesus, grew up with Jesus, had a hard time believing he was the Messiah, believed he was the Messiah, said they called him camel knees because he prayed all the time. He was simply on his knees. John is in the spirit praying when he receives the book of Revelation. So prayer is our connection to God Almighty. It's very important. We get saved by asking, praying Christ to come into our lives. We get prayed. We understand the gospel, what I just explained to you about the substitute of Jesus for our sins, how we go to God through his finished work, because we're not perfect. So if we go there and we start wanting to pray to God and the devil peeps the condemnation, because he's the accuser of the brethren. You know that, right? So he accuses you and you feel unworthy. You have to go through Jesus. That's your connection to God, not your own works. And then that connection will bring a holy and righteous life just because you're abiding in Christ. So to ask Jesus to cleanse us, to ask Jesus to fill us is what we do. We continue to pray. We don't just stop at the sinner's prayer. We continue to pray. We continue to live a life of repentance. We ask to be cleansed and filled. And we, we want to continue in this every day. And, that, and, and to lead us to everlasting life. What kind of prayer brings confidence? Well, that his will will be done in our lives. To change my mind, anoia, to repent, to change the way I think, to renew my mind by the water of his word, to lead me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, because he promised that's what he wants to do in my life. I just have to yield to it and pray. Prayer is always heard. A prayer that is prayed according to his will is always heard by the Lord, by God Almighty. And he intercedes on our behalf because Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. That's his job. So the prayer is always heard if it's prayed in his will and in confidence that because his word says it, it will. So you got to know the promises of God. Now, I'm not talking about some name it and claim it promise type deal. I'm talking about the promises of God. Promises of God are for us. It's like you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lord, I want my mind stayed on thee. Lord, I want to take every thought captive. I really want to live with this, this joy that's supposed to blow, bubble up in my innermost being and come out of my, 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 my body. I mean, how, how much of us lack joy? Occasionally I do. I want that joy of the Lord in my heart. Well, how do I get it? I got to claim prize. Lord, you said you'd give it to me if I ask. You said if I ask the Father, he'd give me more of your spirit. I want righteousness in my life. I want these things in my life. Lord, you do these in me. And all I'm going to do is yield. Make me more like you. So that should be a prayer that we always are continually praying. His will is too that none perish, but all come to repentance. You want people to be saved in your family? Pray it, because he wants them to be saved as well. John's going to tell us about how fair prayer fits into the equation of confidence. Verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If you have a pen, underline according to his will, he heareth us. How do you know his will? Well, you got to know his word. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So the word for confidence in the Greek, this word for confidence, is an interesting one. It's, it's parisia. It means freedom in speaking. It means frankly, 
open, without any concealment, fearless, confidence, unreservedness, how you would talk to your wife or your husband, basically. Most often translated boldness or no fear, or it could mean plainly, easily, familiarity. He could have used the word trust or faith, but here he uses a different word. He uses this word straight to boldness. Confidence, familiarity, very comfortable speaking on speaking terms with, with God. And this is the comfortableness, the confidence that we have when we speak to him, that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So that right there is an amazing thing that I, with all my past and all my failures and all my difficulties and all the sin, see, the sin that easily besets us, if that keeps besetting us, that will ruin our confidence as well. That with all those things going on in my life, that God hears my prayer based upon the redemption that Christ has given me in his blood and the intercession that he gives for me. So that I, with all that failure, I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Now I can go boldly to the throne of grace and ask for help when I'm needy. Now, a lot of people mock at that idea. Do you really think your prayers can move an omnipotent holy God, that God's um, sovereignty trumps your little prayer, trumps whatever you might want to do. If there is such a thing as God, he got a better thing to do than listen to all these people praying at him at one time. Some people, like I said, say that the sovereignty of God trumps your prayer. And, and many don't pray. They become fatalistic. And they don't work. They, they, they don't, God's heart is not moved on their behalf. Our prayers reflect what we think about our God. If we think he's not going to move on our behalf and we lack faith when we pray, then you're going to get that type of prayer back because that's the God that you're, you're trusting in, a God that's capricious and might or might not answer your prayers. If you're praying according to his will, you can have confidence, confidence that he will answer your prayer. That means there's one if, though, if we pray according to his will, right? Right? So what is his will, you might say? He's going to hear me if I pray according to his will. How do I know I'm praying according to the will of God? How do I know that my prayers are exactly what God will answer? Well, it first of all, it has to be in accordance with God's word. If it's not in accordance with God's word, don't think you're going to get the prayer that you're asking for. Some prayers we ask for, we're not going to receive simply because they're prayed according to our desires and our will and not his will. And sometimes he doesn't answer prayers, and I'm glad he doesn't answer some of my prayers. Because they're prayed in a moment where I want something done to, to relieve me of pressure. When it's exactly what he wants from me. He wants to put me under pressure so that I can learn something. So it must be according to his will. It must be in accordance with his word. And it must, we must be living in the will of God. Psalm 66, 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I'm living wrong on purpose and I know it, right? And I regard... Do not think the Lord will hear you. You have to repent and set that right. Repentance is the key, changing your mind. So understanding what God wants. Isaiah 29 says this, 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to honor me, Jesus quoted this to the religious leaders, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. So you got to understand, they were believing that by following a law of their own making, that God owed them salvation. I fast. Twice a week, I give a tithe, a tenth of all that I have. I never miss church. I do this, I do that. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that publican over there. You owe me. You owe me salvation. I have lived up to my end of the bargain. Nobody's going to get to heaven by living up to any bargain. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds that of a Pharisee, you will not get into the kingdom of heaven. We're all in big trouble if that's the case. If they tied the tenth of all they had, fasted twice a week, I don't think any of us here does that. Well, maybe a half of it. Ten percent maybe. But the fa fasting twice a week, all the things that they did, all the Bible readings that they did, they searched the scriptures daily, for in them they thought they had life, but the scriptures didn't give them life. They're supposed to point them to Jesus, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. He says, but you won't come to me for salvation. 
So whenever you're trying to be legalistic or you're in a system where you think you can actually work your way to God, you're already failing. All of our approach to an almighty God has to come through Jesus, the Lamb of God, has to come through the sacrifice, the Lamb that was once and for all slain. No human being can come to God any other way. That is the only way that mankind can restore, have a right relationship with God, or actually live in a way that pleases God, or actually want to live in a way that pleases God. You have to be connected to Jesus. It's impossible any other way. So, if you pray according to his will and you, you, you live in that will or you hunger and thirst after righteousness and your life is heading towards that will, you're growing in that will. I'm not talking about perfection. You can guarantee you'll be praying according to his will and your prayers will be heard. If you're not living it, if your prayers are coming from a root of bitterness because you're angry at someone, you're coming from a dark place, don't think that God's going to answer that prayer as well. The words may sound correct, but if they're coming from the heart that's not filled with the love and the grace of God for other people's benefits, then... then He's going to disregard that prayer. What hinders our prayer scripturally? Let me give you a couple. 1 Peter 3, 7. This is why marriage is so important. This is why marrying a believer is so important. And this is also why we need to keep our marriages tight. Do you know if I'm not getting along with Charm or we're fighting or arguing, your pastor's prayers are being, are being hindered by his, himself. I'm doing it to myself. Let me read this for you. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So we have to have, we're two, the two become one flesh, this marriage unit that I have. If we're born again, we need to keep our roles godly. The man is to be the head, the woman is the weaker vessel, but we're supposed to honor her. We're supposed to love her. We're supposed to lay our life down for her, not get frustrated with her, get aggravated with her. Amen, men, or men are looking at me like, why are you talking about us? What about the women? <laughs> women aren't you supposed to submit. They have a hard time with that. But I'm talking about us right now. So he's saying, you guys got to dwell together. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. So you, you got to dwell together so that your prayers are not hindered. So marital relationship, how important is that? Trouble with our relationships with each other. Matthew 5, Jesus specifically gives this. He says, look, before you head to church, you bring your gift to the altar. You want, you want the sacrifice of God to be applied to your benefit. You're coming to the altar. And you remember that thy brother has something against thee, anything, Leave your gift at the altar, go your way first, be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your great gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way, lest at any time they deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and be kissed in the prison. So he's saying, look, settle those things in the body of Christ quickly. Quickly with one another. Don't let them fester. Otherwise, your service to God will be hindered. Your prayer will be hindered. Third thing is, you know why our, our, we're not praying according to God's will? We don't know God's word. We simply just don't have enough. We're, we're milk. We're not meat yet. So they don't have, they, the Corinthians didn't have enough. And Paul couldn't even give them enough. They were still carnal. So how can we pray according to his will if we don't know his word? John 15, 7, Jesus says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So if his words abide in you, you'll pray according to his will and anything you ask will be done for you. But people miss out on all that. They just, oh, we'll just claim whatever. Pro I, Lexus, arrive in the parking lot when I get out of here. Oh, God didn't answer my prayer. Paul prayed many times for the thorn in the flesh to be removed, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Some prayers don't get answered this side of eternity. That's just the way it is. When we're living right, abiding in Jesus and his word, when we're praying, knowing God's word, and we're praying it on target from a heart filled with boldness and conviction, he is hearing and he is answering. Let's break the verse down. Effectual, on target prayer. That means you're praying specifically what God wants. Fervent, which means it's boiling. You don't just go once. You continue praying about it. You continue all day long. Lord, lift up this person. I lift up this person. I lift up this person. Heal him if it's your will. Lord, give him comfort. Give him peace. People that are going through cancer right now, you should be praying that all day for Scott. All day. Praying it. For his life. Because you want it prayed for your life if you're in the same position. It's the same thing. The peace of God would rule in his heart. He would have assurance of his salvation. He have assurance of everything. He needs that right now, Lord. 
Please, go, go to him. Be with him. Anybody that's struggling. Lord, there's some kids out there. They're, they're running around. Lord, they, they need your conviction. They need your spirit, Lord. Please draw close to them. Bring them back to you. Bring all the prodigals home, Lord. You're, you're the father that stands out there. I know your word. You're looking for them to come home. That's your heart. I want that too. God will answer those prayers. God, I want to love my wife better. I want to be a better husband. He will answer that prayer. I want my prayers not to be hindered. I want you to hear them when I, when I pray. I'm having a hard time in my marriage. Pray. Pray according to his will. He will answer. He will fix your marriage. He'll fix you. He might not fix the other one. He'll fix you so that you'll be able to live with whatever is happening. And you'll be content. It's very important that you realize that. What does it say? So fervent is boiling. Righteous means living it. You're living what you're praying. Availeth means it's a winning prayer. You want winning prayer. So it's at that point we can bring our openness and frankness and our requests to the Lord. Lord, you know, you can say you love my kids. You're not willing any should perish. I know the verse. I claim that. I just want you to save them, Lord, and I'll keep praying it. And if I don't see it before I die, I'm expecting to see them in heaven, Lord. I'm just trusting you with that. And you keep bringing it because it's his will that you do. And he hears. He hears that. I hear you. I hear your word. I hear my word being prayed. And then, then, then wait and keep bringing it. Many prayers won't be answered, like I said, to heaven. To show how powerful prayer is, John's going to give us an example of a prayer God will answer. A word on prayer, too, I want you to realize. You must realize the Lord will eventually answer all of our prayers that are prayed according to his will. What do I mean by that? We will all be healed one day. We will all receive new bodies from Jesus. We will all be there one day. No matter what pain we go through, we will get those bodies and we will be rejoicing with Jesus in heaven. Every old person that's in a nursing home, everybody that we sit there and pray about, everybody with cancer, everybody's like, breaks my heart. All that stuff is going to be gone. No more sickness, no more death. He will answer every prayer. Every prayer that we pray. We'll get healing. We will get healing and we will get everything that we didn't understand here. It'll all be made right. So you got to trust that. You got to look at the long view when you're bringing your prayers. Jesus will resurrect folks. And we'll all be resurrected. There will be world peace. There will be no war. Everybody will sit under their own vine and fig tree. Nobody will make them afraid. There will be perfect fellowship. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Those prayers will be answered. As we see our world spinning out of control and we say, Lord, where's the peace? The people are nuts. Well, we have to realize he predicted these things would happen. The rapture of the church is so very close, I believe. And I believe what God is doing to a lot of people with a lot of the things that are going on in churches is separating the wheat from the chaff a little bit in our hearts and in our mind. He's giving people afflictions. Prayer is really important to a lot of people. He's giving people afflictions to draw them closer to him. It's very difficult. The older we get too, the more we should be drawn to the Lord. The more we should realize where our hope and destiny, destiny lies. And especially young kids too. They got their life ahead of them. Look what happened to them. I feel bad this whole year, 2020. No graduation. No uh, school stop. Everything just, just halted. Lives put on hold. Marriages. We had to have one here with just 10 people here for the two kids that were getting married. They had to put it out on the, on the internet so people could watch it. It's sad. But our hope is not in this world. One day we're going to get married to Jesus in heaven. We're called the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's a wedding we're all going to want to be at. Amen. And he's been planning that for 2,000 years, so it's better than any wedding we're planning down here for a year. So all those will be answered. Many times you got to wait. you got to wait for it. And that's the difficulty. That's the rub in the life. Verse 16. If any man, these are difficult verses. I'll, I'll give you my opinion. You can... You can... Read through and you can study all the commentaries and then come to your own conclusion if you want. If any man sees his brother's sin, a sin, A is not in there, so it reads like this. If any man sees his brother's sin, sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall, and he shall give him life for them that sin, not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. There is sin, not unto death. Okay, so basically, verse 16 God promises to bless the prayer made on behalf of a brother who is in sin, to restore the sinner, to restore somebody that's gone off track. Your first job is not to confront the guy, put the guy in full Nelson and say, you're sinning, you're sinning, you're sinning. No, it's to pray. It's not to do anything but pray. You're supposed to not say anything to the person first. You're supposed to go to God and say, Lord, forgive that person. 
And God, on your behalf, intercessory prayer will work. Why do you think I tell Miss Susan to pray for me all the time? She's been praying for me from the beginning. She's interceding for me. And I know God's listening, and I, I want her to intercede for me. Because God says right here, if, if I'm doing anything stupid with my day, she'll pray and God will help me. Amen? Amen. So keep praying. I need all the prayers I can get. Trust me. So he's saying, look, the first thing we should do in church, there's a couple things, but the Bible says we're supposed to, this is the, how we're supposed to treat people in church. We're supposed to restore the sinner. The person that's backsliding, having difficulty, that wants to do right, we're supposed to restore that person. We're supposed to remove the divisive person, the person that's continually dividing everybody. See, Satan divides. Interesting, too, our country is being divided by propaganda, and people can't even see it. The whole thing is propaganda. The whole thing. Most white people like black people, and most black people like white people. But if you watch the news, that's not the case. Every white man wants to kill every black person that ever lived. That's a lie. That's not true. It's not true. And in the Church of Jesus Christ, we're not divided. It includes all races, all colors, male and female, neither, neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ. We all have the same destiny in Christ. We may have different jobs and roles to fulfill because we're male and female, and God made us that way, but we're no different when we all get to heaven. We're all one in Christ. And the beauty of, of how we were made will be fully realized in heaven. Satan divides. He accuses. And it doesn't matter if the accusations are true or not. We're looking at all the accusations going on in our country, and we're seeing all the lies that we've been told for three years, and anybody tells me they're going to believe the news, you, 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 need, you need to shut it off. And you need to focus on the Word of God and the promises of God and the love of God, and then share that love of God with everybody, whether they be Jew, Greek, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, oriental, it doesn't matter. But yet, we want to divide. See, they want you divided on race, class, religion, whatever they can divide you on to keep themselves in power. Because if we all united, they'd be done in a day. And they know that. They also know that the governments of this world, righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. Why do you think they promote sin and promiscuity and all the drugs and everything else and big pharma is hooking everybody on nonsense? How, how do you think that? Because they know it, it, it will result in your enslavement. Jesus Christ wants to set you free. There's a big difference between the world and what we're doing. We're not of the world. We're, 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 our, our home is heaven. We have a different destiny, a different calling. So, first thing we do for backsliders is we pray for them. We restore them. Then we're supposed to settle our personal differences with one another and remove divisive people. The problem is some of the divisive people, they usually get in places of leadership because they, they know how to worm their way in there. And then we have to root them out, which is a, can be difficult. So when we see a brother in sin, the first thing we should do is pray, not confront. People always ask me, well, how come you don't act sooner? Because I'm praying. Leave me be. Lots of times God will work it all out and I don't have to get involved. Amen? You don't want me involved? I'm an idiot. It's much better if God by his Holy Spirit does it in your life than me trying to mess around and tinker in your life. It's a problem. When, when elders and all that, they start tinkering in everybody's lives, it's, it's a mess. Because we get involved in the tinkering. We think we're doing God's work and we may have some verses, but it's coming from our own prejudices a lot of times. So if you pray it, bathe it in prayer and then confront, you'll be a lot better off. And then pray again. I try to wait it out. I try to let God figure it out before I have to make any decision at all. I don't want to do it because I don't want to be responsible for that. I'm not rooting out. I'm not tear hunting because if I do, I might actually hurt a wheat. And what if I do that? Then I have to answer for that. So be careful how you treat one another. Settle your personal differences. If somebody's being divisive, wait on it, pray on it, then go and then confront. And then I, I can guarantee you, God has a really good mechanism of cleaning out his body. And if you can just wait long enough, he'll do it. Because it might be you that needs to go. Just saying. Most of the time, the last thing we do is pray. We get our phone and we get a posse and we tell everybody what's going on. So... 
we pray first, we're fulfilling the command to love, which is the most important, and God hears that prayer, and God will give that person health, life, healing, restoration. As believers, we should pray for restoration for our brothers and sisters. That's the clear teaching. The hard part of this verse is there is a sin leading to death, and there is a sin leading not to death. So I want to know what that sin is. <laughs> Good. I, I can tell you, I don't really know, because I searched all day. Uh, but, and then he says, all sin is unrighteousness. And basically, so we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, none. All sin is unrighteousness, and there is a sin not unto death. So everyone is a sinner. So some people see here the unpardonable sin. He's talking about, you know, they're saying, he's talking about the unpardonable sin. The Holy Spirit continually convicts you. And it could be. I don't know. But it could be. People get continually convicted. They push that conviction away. They don't want the Lord in their life. And that's a sin unto death. He's saying, I don't want you to pray for those people. They're gone. That could be what he's saying. Or I believe John is telling us something a little different here. But like I said, both are in view. I don't, I don't know. But I think he's telling us there is a sin that leads to the physical death of a believer. Okay? Because that's taught in Scripture as well. That God removes people that are in the body causing... Uh, put it this way. If they won't be woken up, then God removes them sometimes. And this is a difficult concept, but it's not without biblical precedent. Let me give you some biblical references so that you can know I'm not just making it. This is what I think it says. Moses, when Moses sinned against God, he misrepresented God to the congregation, remember? Now, Moses was probably the most patient man. He writes about himself that he was the meekest man. Meek means strength under control. So he never, like, pushed his authority on anybody. And you could tell that. David was the same way. He didn't do it either. And that's why there was insurrections against them. Because they were like that. Absalom made an insurrection. Korah made a rebellion against Moses. Moses one time, and what really upsets me sometimes, I'm like, man, God, that's harsh. One time he flips out. Anybody here flipped out in their house? More than once? I've got like a list. My wife knows every single time I flipped out. She's like Rain Man. February 23rd, this date. I'm like, but that was the winner. I was depressed. Numbers 20 says this. This is what happens to poor Moses. Numbers 20, 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you believe me not to sanctify him in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. They waited 40 years. They left Egypt, saw the miracles. Moses staffed at all those miracles. God worked marvelously through Moses. Talked to Moses like no other man. He says, look, I can't let you and Aaron go in. Moses asked God continually, look, forgive me. I want to go in. I want to see the end of my work. And God says, speak no, no more to me of this matter. Not listening. Eventually, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration in Israel speaking to Jesus face to face about his decease. So God had something better for Moses. And I believe at the end of the age, he's still got more work left to do. Moses does. He's one of the two witnesses that I believe. So he had sinned a sin at that point unto death. He was going to die. He was going to play out the string, and he wasn't going to be able to go into the why so severe? Well, the greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. Second example, Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody remember Ananias and Sapphira? What did they do? They were believers. They, were, they didn't go straight to hell when they died. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They tried to say, we gave it all so the people, they could get the ah of the people they cared about what people thought about them than being honest before the Holy Spirit and saying, I, I, this, we gave 10%, we gave 50%. Is it all everything? Yeah, we gave everything. And boom, he lied to the Holy Ghost, he fell down dead. So when faced with their sin, they lied about it, and boom, they died. That was sin on death. Peter wasn't praying for them to be resurrected. He said, buried them. They immediately went to be with the Lord. Now, an example of a prayer that was heard was when poor Eutychus fell asleep because Paul's sermon was so boring. And he fell out the window. God heard that prayer, resurrected that guy. So evidently that was according to his will. The Corinthians, now, you got, I'm going to read about this because I think it's important. They were making a mockery of communion. 1 Corinthians says this, 11.21. This is probably the best example of all. And the I, um, 11.21 for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. So you're all hoarding your own supper. One is hungry and another person is drunken. Verse 29 goes through all, all, all what they're doing wrong and how they're, 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 they're not taking the communion table right. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh destruction. Damnation there just means destruction to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. So the people that weren't eating and drinking the community table properly are coming there properly with the respect that, they, that was due the community table, the Lord's table. For this cause, many are weak and sickly. People were getting sick and many were dying, sleeping. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So evidently, according to the scripture, a believer can sin to the point where God is through with them, where it's best for God to remove them because they're worse for the kingdom of God being here than being taken home. Furthermore, God knows everything. So think about it this way. If he knows I'm going to do something stupid five years from now and he takes me before then, you're going to be a lot happy that he did. Especially if you would have shipwrecked a lot of other people with your sin. So remember that. So we want to live holy. We want to grow in holiness. So that kind of stuff doesn't have to happen to us. God doesn't have to take us away because our, our testimony is so poor here that he says, I, I can't, you know, I can't have them there anymore. They're discredit to my kingdom, not a credit to my kingdom. And God believes it's best to remove them in every circumstance. It's because they compromised their testimony so significantly, it was best to bring them home. Now, in the end, when we see a brother or sister sin, basically what he's saying here is we should pray. When we see a Christian being corrected by God for a willful sin and they're refusing to repent, the situation is in God's hand. Then we say, Lord, you do what you think is best. Pray that his will will be done. So I would personally prefer the Lord, you know, stop us from doing something really stupid by taking us home. It would be painful for my family and people around me, and I wouldn't want to do that. That's why I want to live my life righteously for the Lord. But if he knows that, quit while you're ahead. I, God, God knows that. The Lord's gracious even in that. Not every sin leads to physical death. The wall on righteousness is sin. Eventually, sin kills us all, correct? We're all going to die because we're sinners. We can't live forever. So important. We can't say any particular sin that this is the sin unto death. Like, oh, they did the sin unto death. That doesn't, that's not in view here. So we can't just extrapolate our own sin here. But we can say that there is sin plural unto death when God gives us opportunity after opportunity. And we continually and deliberately refuse obedience to his word. He says, I'm going to take you home. You won't trust, you know, I can't trust you in this world any longer. I will deal with you at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Example, you know, when I was outside playing with my friends and arguing, my mom would yell at me and say, look, you know, you don't keep behaving like that or I'm going to make you come inside, right? And eventually I keep acting like that. What happened? I didn't get to go play with my friends. I have to come inside. And that's exactly what the Lord does in some ways to some of us. Um, same with the Lord. Many opportunities. This could also apply to blaspheming the spirit. You can take either one. Those are the two best explanations I came across. I kind of like, since it's in the context of, of brothers and, and, and Christianity and assurance of salvation, I think he's talking about people that are willfully sinning, not listening, and then they, they wind up being taken home early, like the Corinthians. So that's my take on it. But like I said, you can read 15. And if you come up with a new one, let me know what you come up with. Verse 18. We know inwardly. Now that word is, is gnosis. That means actually we understand because he downloaded into us. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. So we know internally. Internally, we already know that if we've been born again, we can't continue in a lifestyle that practices sin. We all know that we fail, but we cannot continually practice sin as a lifestyle and be okay with it. That's very important. So it's an unbroken lifestyle of sin. We know that anybody who's been born of God can't do that. You, uh, you know, if you can do that, you haven't been broken of yourself. But a believer has been broken and they've repented. We have an internal witness and I can't continue to live in sin or I got a whooping coming or I'm not feeling right about it. I can't do it. It's something that's incongruent with who I am. And I can give you like many examples. I cannot go sit at a bar and drink. I feel bad. I just can't do it anymore. There's something about me that says, mm, it's not right. Now, I'm not saying somebody can't go have a glass of wine at a bar or anything. For me, it just represents my whole old lifestyle and it's something I can't really do anymore. There's things that God has taken out of my life, behaviors. I can't walk around cussing anymore. I used to cuss like a, like a champ. You'd be, 
I can talk, right? That's one of my jobs. I talk a lot. You should see me when I was cussing. I could cuss good too. <laughs> but I don't cuss no more. Occasionally when I get frustrated, it pops into my brain, which I consider it still cursing. And I have to confess it because it's here. It didn't, didn't come out of here, but it's still there. <clears throat> still did it because I thought about it. What I'm saying is I don't feel good. I couldn't continue to talk like that as a habit or a lifestyle, all right? I can't do it any longer. I can't say F, F as an adjective. I just can't do it. It's not part of my life anymore. Those are the types of things that you should be seeing are changing in your life. God's working on you. God's conforming you into his image and likeness. So you can't live a lifestyle like that. And what's interesting is here, he goes... Um, we, we seek to guard ourselves. He said, you know, uh, verse 18, but keepeth, that means he guards himself. So we guard ourselves and give no occasion for stumbling. So we guard ourselves. I don't put myself in a position where I could sin anymore or I would want to sin or I would be tempted to sin. But he also says we have unique protection in the spiritual warfare. It says the wicked one comes and that wicked one touches us not. And the word for touch is really interesting because it means grasp or clinging. John only uses it two times in all of his writings. He uses it in, in, his, in the gospel of John when he's talking about Mary clinging on to Jesus. Remember when Mary clings on to Jesus when he's resurrected and he says, let go of me. She's like, Jesus. You know, she won't let go of him. She's draped all over him. She's so excited, right? And he says, you got to stop. You're draping all over me, you know, I just, I, I can't move with you all over me. So she has Jesus in a full-on clutch hanging off of him. When we meet Jesus, the interesting thing is, is Satan can't hang on to us any longer like that. They've broken the power. See, the rest of the world, Satan is clutching onto them. They're blinded by the God of this world. They can't move. They think they're free, but they're not. Once you're born again, Satan no longer has that hold on your life anymore. So all the things that he had, the hooks in you, are they go away. And all you have to do is claim the victory. Now, sometimes it takes a, a little while for some of those things to catch up, but they always catch up because he's conforming you into his image and likeness. Do you understand? He's no longer draped all over you. He doesn't have that power anymore. He only has a power that you give him. If you yield to Jesus, those things will fall away, those besetting sins. So it's interesting. Jesus came and bound the strong man and set us free, which means he has everybody in captivity until Christ sets you free. So we need to pray that the Holy Spirit wakes people up in the world. They're blinded by the God of this world. He's draped all over them. They can't see. They'll come to a message like this. They don't hear nothing. They're just totally in the world. They, don't, they haven't been born again by the Spirit of God. This means a lot to us because we see it because we've been born, by the, born again by the Spirit of God. So Satan set me free. I'm so glad. Aren't you glad he bound the strong man? Look at your life and tell me he hasn't done anything for you. If he hasn't, then you need to check yourself. Make your calling and election sure, Peter would say. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. So it says here, we know that the son of God has come. We know Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, correct? Anybody who knows that and believes in that, he says, you have to confess that to be born again. And hath given us. So if, if he's given it to us. That means it's not earned, correct? Correct. So he's given us an understanding. So this understanding is given, is not earned. It means that he has revealed himself to us in a very special way. He's given that to us. Our Redeemer has come. We know him. We are in him. His name is Jesus, the only true God, the author and finisher of our faith. He gives us eternal life. What a gift. And he gives us an understanding of who he is so that we can know him. And we'll know that it's true. And we're in him. So it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. That's the true God. That's eternal life. That's how we recognize it. That's the gift of God. Verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. The word there is guard, garrison. So he's asking us to do something here. Keep ourselves from idols. Anything that comes between your soul and Jesus is an idol. It's as simple as that. Anything that alters our path of obedience to God is an idol. And the sad thing is it can be my children. 
It can be a hobby. It can be, it can be anything. It can be a pet. It can be anything that you put in between. If it alters your obedience to Jesus, it's got to go. You got to put everything in subordination to Jesus first. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then you'll be able to love your wife. Sometimes you can put your, your marital relationship. That can be idolatry. Like if I, if I lost charm, that would be very hard for me to move along in life. I lean on her a lot. I've been married to her for a long time. She's like part of me. So I count on her. We figured out all the stuff that we do right and don't do right. So we, we compliment each other. It took us a while to get to that too. It's a lot of time invested in this relationship I have. But I realize how much I need her in my life and, and all those things. But if she's more important than Jesus, when she goes and if God takes her first, am I going to be, is it over for me? That would be an idol that I would put above the Lord because the Lord is my strength and my song and my sustainer and my redeemer. Charm is a great helpmate, but she's not him. And the same thing goes for whatever you might put there. And he's saying, you got to guard yourself from that. See, the God gives us wonderful things. Marriage and children and all those things are good. I, I didn't even think I would deserve those blessings before I got saved. Now that I have them, sometimes I want to hold on to them. And I got to learn to let them go. Life is a journey. And unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. You got to let your kids go. I'm learning that. Thank you, Drew. <laughs> learning those lessons that I have to learn. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I got to let go. The same thing goes as we get older. Eventually, we're going to have to let go of these bodies in this life. And if this is an idol, this will keep you from God just like anything else. It can keep my health. I can try to eat all the health food I like, and I'm into health. But that's going to go. There's something to be said about keeping yourself from all that idolatry in the world. And it can crop up anywhere. Vacationing, money-making, the things of this world, the enticements, the allurements, all the things you think are going to make you happy here... And they kind of fall flat when you know the Lord because he is the ultimate reward. He's what we're looking for. He's the, he's the prize. Eternity is, the goal, is ahead of us. So he's saying, don't let anything. This church can become an idol. Oh, let's build a bigger building. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's get excited. And all those things start to rev in your head. And it's like, but God will do what he's going to do. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Take every day, one day at a time, guard yourself from idolatry because the Satan's going to throw that at you. If you want assurance, if you want assurance that you know the Lord, then, then draw close to him and he will draw near to you. Learn how to pray. Learn a good connection with the Lord. Learn how to pray according to his will. Know his word. And anytime you fail, understand the gospel is still there for us. This is the gospel that saved us. It's the gospel that keeps us. So when we pray, we say, Lord, I'm coming to you based on what Jesus Christ has done. I need your help to get rid of this stuff in my life. It's becoming an idolatry to me. I want to be closer to you. And guess what? He's faithful to answer every prayer that we come to him like that. Let's stand. We'll pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this gospel, First John, Lord. And Lord, I could probably do a series on assurance because I, I, I need that in my own life many times. Because Lord, I think I'm so conditioned to see you from an earthly side sometimes and not from the grace that you've poured out in my life, Lord. Sometimes we try so hard to please you, Lord, that we don't see that you're already pleased in your son. He's already pleased you with the things he's done. We can't add to that work, Lord can't keep ourselves saved. We can't add anything to the cross, Lord. It's your work. It's your gift to us. Help us to receive it by faith and then help us to grow. Lord, because you said if these things be in you and they abound in you, you say in your word, then we'll never be sl slack concerning assurance, Lord, to add to our faith temperance, self-control, patience, love for others, Lord. All those things, if they abound and are in us, Lord, we'll never lack for assurance, Lord, you've said in your word. And you've already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So I think sanctification, Lord, that process, Lord, lends to assurance. So continue to do that work in our life, Lord. Continue to cleanse, continue to sanctify, continue to work in each one of our lives. And Lord, let us understand, Lord, that this work is not going to be complete until we arrive in your likeness on that other shore. And give us, Lord, a hope 
of that, Lord. As I see these things going on in the world, Lord, I'm excited because I know that my redemption is drawing nigh, Lord. I know that your return is soon, Lord. And everything that we hope in is, is ahead of us, Lord. So let us see things, Lord, through the lens of eternity, Lord, and help us, Lord, to set our affections there, we pray. I pray for anyone in this room who might not know you. I pray that they would understand how easy it is to receive you as their Lord and Savior, and then to continue to walk as they found you, to walk in you like that, Lord. I pray for us that we would go back to the beginning, Lord, and start our walk, just like we walked. We're just amazed that you loved us. Help us to leave this place just as amazed as the night we got saved.